Before I uh, talk specifically about those simulations, I want to give a little introduction to how we use the cloud computing, because a lot of people seem to be interested in that. And then I'll talk about one of the pharmacogenetic drugs that we're focused on, Warfarin, and then the framework for modeling and simulations that we use to do these personalized clinical trial simulations. So in general, um, the way I think about translational medicine is uh, this idea of these problems represented by these round holes on the clinical side. Maybe the problem is observed by physicians, for example. They give a dose of a, of a prescribed drug to an individual. 50, 60% of the time that dose works very well. The individual responds as you would anticipate. And maybe 30% of the time, the dose does not work very well, but they do a small adjustment um, over perhaps a few days or a week, and they can get the correct therapeutic dose. But in some cases, that small adjustment um, and the rule of thumb and best practice that they know so well doesn't work at all. And there, something else is coming into play. And that's one of the small holes that I think of uh, in, in the clinical side, which then gets mapped over to the research enterprise. And in the United States, normally that problem, let's say a better way to either engineer a drug or modify a drug or prescribe a drug or create a protocol to give the drug, is translated into three specific aims associated with the NIH grant. And then the research investigators spend a lot of time trying to solve that problem. And I represent their solutions, the research solution is square pegs. And those square pegs, sometimes we try to get them to fit into those round holes on the clinical side and they don't work quite as well as we had hoped. So what we do in my lab is to try to understand how can we take these square pegs, not the creation of new square pegs, not the creation, for example, of a new drug or a new drug target or a new genetic association uh, with a phenotype or a treatment, but rather the kind of solutions that, that exist already uh, represented by these square pegs and find a way to better manipulate them and use them in a, in a manner that takes advantage of those solutions but brings them closer to a clinical setting. And the way we do that is with simulations and predictions and mathematical modeling. And then we do the entire thing um, in my lab, the Laboratory for Personalized Medicine. And as I mentioned to you before, all the simulations and computer work that we do is done using Amazon Web Services, which is one version of the cloud computing environment. And you may be aware of Amazon Web Services. Uh, we actually have two environments that we work on and developed. Uh, one is what I call translational research. It's sort of taking the raw square pegs and making them look a little more round. And the other is what I call a clinical translational environment, where we're taking environments for example, that look exactly like electronic medical records of the kind of systems that you would find in a hospital and testing out those roundish pegs to try to get them rounder yet so they fit better when you deploy them in a clinical environment. This is a general framework that my lab operates in. We have lots of collaborations with hospitals and uh, clinics and research centers. Uh, but we're very interested in, in our particular activity in this domain, in this kind of virtual cloud-enabled domain. And we'll, I'll talk about one example of what we do. And that example is focused around the drug, which in the United States is the most prescribed drug. And I actually don't know uh, its level of prescription in most areas of the world. I know in Asia it's very used uh, quite a bit. And we're doing a series of clinical trials based upon our analysis in Japan, and they think that they're going to extend that to some trials in China. Uh, but perhaps in the Middle East, warfarin is another is a commonly used uh, 
anticoagulant drug. Warfarin is given, um, warfarin is given to uh, reduce the, the viscosity of blood. And it's given generally before surgeries, especially uh, hip and knee joints, or large joint surgeries, where the large arteries are. And the body responds to that surgery, releasing the series of hormones and proteins that then cause the triggering of um, a physiological response to thicken the blood. And the reason they give warfarin is because uh, that thickened blood has a, increases the risk of the individual to a thrombotic event, a blood clotting event, during or briefly after the surgery. So the largest use of warfarin is, is in that scenario. It's also used in some clinical situations of long-term management of, of, uh, of uh, blood, man, uh, blood viscosity. In the U.S. the last few years, there were 30 million prescriptions annually. So it's, it's quite heavily used. Um, and there are some risks to either over-prescribing warfarin or under-prescribing warfarin. If you over-prescribe it, your blood is too thin and there tend to, tends to be spontaneous bleeding. And if you under-prescribe it, your blood is too thick and there's a, tend to, a tendency to a risk to the thrombotic event, the event that you're trying to avoid by prescribing warfarin. And so it has this very narrow therapeutic window. You have to get the dosing correct, either not too much or not too little. And if you're in that therapeutic window, then um, the individual will presumably will, will uh, respond well to whatever the issue is, usually again, surgery of some type. The genetics come in because two genes, CYP2C9 and BKRC1, have a role that they play in two different metabolic pathways, both of which influence the speed at which warfarin is metabolized in the bloodstream. And uh, those individuals with certain genotypes in those two genes, I won't go through the details, but some of them metabolize very quickly warfarin, and others, depending on your genotype, metabolize very slowly. Those that metabolize warfarin very quickly because of their genetic background tend to need a higher dose of warfarin in order to maintain that therapeutic range. And those that metabolize warfarin slowly tend to need less of a, a level of prescription in order to maintain the same therapeutic range. And the trick is to know which individuals you need to adjust which way. And in order to do that, you need to look at their genetic background. Um, there's been a, a study done, and this is not just a theoretical analysis, but a study done to analyze and predict the impact of reducing the adverse response to warfarin dosing in the U.S. population, where some 100,000 negative reactions to inaccurate dosing of warfarin can be avoided each year, it's estimated. And the result of that is some billion dollars in saving in healthcare. Because if you reduce the risk, you reduce the, the adverse response, and you reduce the amount of time in the hospital, and so on and so forth. So it's a very dramatic improvement in healthcare if you can adjust that therapeutic level correctly. In 2007 and later in 2009, the Federal, Federal Drug uh, Administration released a, a new uh, designation labeling for warfarin. And in that designation, for the first time, genotype was included as a uh, required, not a requirement, but a recommendation associated with prescribing this dose. And it's the first time, I believe, in the, in the internationally or in the United States, where a federal entity or, or national entity required or recommended and later required genotyping as part of the activity associated with prescription of delivery of health care. Um, oh, so, so what we want to do is simulate the population and the variation and try to understand how do you best use genotyping in the hospital setting across a large population where there's a lot of variance in the prediction of the 
therapeutic level of, of, um, of the drug. And this is the follow-up uh, recommendations based upon the two genotypes. Here for CYP2C9, there's so-called STAR1, STAR1 genotypes, STAR1, STAR2, and so on. These are the com combinations of genotypes that individuals fall within. And for BKRC1, the other gene that represents uh, metabolism, uh, the genotypes are represented by AA, AB, and BB. It doesn't particularly matter what those symbols mean. It just represents different types of individuals based upon their genetic background. And these numbers in these tables represent the variation in warfarin dosing and the ta therefore metabolism that you should adjust to depending on which of these genotypes the individual is. So if you're a star one, star one Caucasian uh, individual, your variance is 65% greater than the norm. So your adjustment is actually quite large in order to correct for that. And so on. here's why the Asian populations are so important. For an Asian AA type genotype, the variation is 86%. So it's way off the norm in terms of what therapeutic dosing they should get. And that's why clinical trials in Asia is very important to understand how to best uh, uh, dose warfarin. So those differences are quite large, and uh, I'm just emphasizing it in those boxes. Um, just a little bit of a background. I sort of already went over this. I don't want to go over it in too much more detail, but highly volatile simply means narrow therapeutic range. It means it's adjust, it's, its metabolism is uh, vastly modified by those genotypes. It's a little bit surprising, but it happens in a number of drugs. It uh, requires uh, vigorous patient monitoring, again, to keep within that therapeutic range and reduce that risk. And then these genetic factors are of pragmatic importance in this case. So it's one of those um, key examples of how genetics may play a, an important role in healthcare in the future. Uh, this is a reiteration of those FDA recommendations and a little bit of the differences in the recommended dose up in the lower, up, upper left here. If you're a star one, star one, GG type uh, genotype, your recommended doses per day is between five and seven milligrams of warfarin per day. On the other hand, if you're um, a AABKRC1 and star two, star two, your recommended doses is closer to one milligram per day. That difference of almost six milligrams is actually a lot, and the risk between inaccurately dosing one milligram instead of six, or vice versa, is very high. And so getting this correct is important in terms of the care of the patient. So now we'll talk about how we do our simulations and modeling. And it's a four-step process. We actually create what I would call clinical avatars. They're stochastic representations of populations of individuals. So if you don't have all the patient data that you'd like to have, or you don't have the, the $100 million that you might need to produce a clinical trial that will test all these different factors, you can create individuals uh, syn synthetically or uh, by mathematical modeling that represent that population. Use the simulations that I'm going to talk about, make your predictions, and then it's possible to test whether those predictions are accurate or not, with perhaps a smaller population than the original clinical trial. So the first step is we create these clinical avatars, then we use a dosing algorithm, and this laser pointer is dying on me, but in the, the middle of the slide, the one and two, the gauge dose and the Anderson dose, um, those dosing algorithms are the algorithms that use the data that I was talking about, including the genotypes, to predict the therapeutic dose. The difference between six milligrams or seven milligrams a day in some individuals and one milligram a day in other individuals. Once you have the dosing algorithm accurate, um, you can do a mathematical model of the metabolism of 
warfarin, the circulating warfarin, and then predict the outcome of that, uh, of that manipulation. And if, if you have that modeling correct, those two pieces, the dosing and then the metabolism, then you can use that model to conduct clinical simulation and, and uh, theoretical trials. And what we do in, in our trials is adjust the protocol that's used in the different arms of the trial. trial. I won't get into that too much, but the bottom line is, I'm actually going to walk over here because I can't even see this thing. Um, the bottom line is, is to try to get the individual's their uh, physiological range as much as possible within those two lines. And the, if the individual is within those two lines, we consider them in the therapeutic range. And that's the goal of those clinical trials and those complicated uh, protocols. Okay. A little bit. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, well the way we um, simulate populations and create these clinical avatars is through a Bayesian network model. And I won't get into all the details of that, but you can create a relationship between all of the variables. And it's a phenomenological relationship. And you include all of the variables. Here's a few of them, age, gender, height, weight, CYP2C9 genotype, BKRC1, whether they're smokers or not, whether they're at risk to deep vein thrombosis, and so on and so forth. So all the variables you need to do the simulation, you incorporate into this Bayesian network model. And once you've done that, this is a visual representation of that model. You can actually then use the, you train that model, and once you've validated it, you can use the model to, pr to produce individuals of the right type and style that you're interested in, in conducting the simulation on. And so we do a number of different simulations, some populations in Japan, some populations in the United States, and other places of different type and styles. Uh, we actually have this system available online it's at clinicalavatars.org and you can go there and you can type in parameters for these different variables for populations you're interested in and tell it to run the simulation and it will create those clinical avatars you can ask for 10,000 or uh, 1,000 or 500, however many you want and then you can actually predict from there what the correct dosing is for, the, for those individuals. Uh, the next step that, after you pull all these pieces together is produce the, uh, produce the patients, run them through the dosing algorithm, that gives you the initial warfarin dose, and then um, well, the, and these are all the variables. So for each individual here, whether they're uh, this type or blue or red, their variables are represented by these different uh, parameters here run them through the algorithm, and then predict the warfarin dose. And then do that in a time sequence manner, and you can predict the clinical trial. And this is the part I told you about. Once you have the dose, you input that into this very simplistic uh, multi-compartment model to rep rep that represents the metabolism of warfarin. And what, the, in the simulation, you have a simulation over a number of days. Clinical trials of warfarin are usually 60 to 90 days. And you can see the, um, the so-called INR, which is a measure of the viscosity of blood, um, will vary depending on whether the individual, depending on the genotype of the individual. And so those individuals who have the star three, star three genotype, that's the high metabolizing genotype, their INR will be driven up dramatically at the same therapeutic dose, and so on and so forth. You can see dependencies on age, on, on the combination genotype, or on the individual genotypes. And once you have that, then you can run the trial over 70, 60, this is over 70 hours, and see the variation in the uh, circulating warfarin uh, concentration. And this is an envelope of about 1,000 clinical avatars. For each one who are dosed in a similar manner, it's, a rep it's their response to that dosing. Um, the therapeutic range is somewhere uh, about here. So sometimes they're above the therapeutic range and sometimes they're below. 
This is just a very sim simple test of the system. Now what we do is use the kind of uh, protocols that are actually used in these uh, in the clinical trials and in the, the clinics, where you adjust the dose depending on what that INR is to get that patient into the therapeutic range and keep them there. And those protocols are very complicated. Our, our strategic for us to incorporate them into the, into the computational um, scenario. This is actually a second protocol for maintaining therapeutic dose of warfarin. And you can imagine all of this. If, if, the, if the INR is low, you increase the, the, the dosing. If the INR is high, you increase the not so much, and so on and so forth. And these protocols have been derived in many, many different ways. In fact, we've, we've identified 37 different protocols that have been published for various reasons. So we put all the pieces together, and then we can predict the, predict the uh, standard outcome metric. And in this case, in clinical trials, the outcome metric is over that window of the clinical trial, maybe 60-day window or 90-day window, how many days out of the total did you keep the patient in the therapeutic range? So in warfarin trials, usually you're out of range the first few days, and you try to quickly adjust the, the daily dosing. You hopefully get the patient in therapeutic range very quickly, maybe within four or five days, and then hopefully nothing goes uh, too far off, and you keep them in range from that point on. In that scenario, you would have, for a 60-day clinical trial, maybe 55 days within the therapeutic window and five days outside of the therapeutic window. And your time within the therapeutic window would simply be 55 over 60. If you didn't do a very good job and the protocol was not working, then over 60 days, maybe you'd be out of the therapeutic window for half of that time. 30 of the 60 days, you'd be out of the therapeutic window and 30 of the 60 days would be in the therapeutic window, and then your TTR would be 0.5. So the protocols you want to optimize so that you, your TTR is as close to one as you can make it across all the patients in the trial. And that's what our simulation allows you to do, to adjust those protocols per individual in order to drive the TTR up to one. And that's the bottom line of our simulation. The last point I want to make is we create this large grid of individuals, in this case 200,000 individuals. This is for a trial that we're simulating that has only 200 individuals on one side and 200 on the other side. So 200 are following one protocol and 200 are following a second protocol. But in order to do the simulations and get the stochastics correct, we actually um, generate uh, 1,000 of those trials, 1,200 1, by 200 trials for a total of two, uh, sorry, 100 by 100 individuals in each arm for a total of 200,000 clinical trial, uh, clinical avatars. We put the results of our simulation in a big grid, and then we can pull out and conduct, in effect, um, parallel theoretical trials, and it turns out the statistics work out very well in that case. So I want to show you a visualization of the difference between these protocols. It's actually a lot of data, as many of you deal with in all of your work. And in our case, it was very difficult to see if we change the protocol in two arms and we're running it across 100,000 individuals over 200 trials on one side, and a total of 100,000 individuals and 200 trials on the other side, how can we detect, besides the statistical number, the difference in the two protocols? Which protocol is doing better? And one of the guys came up with this visualization. Oops, sorry. Um, here's a trial that we simulated with 200,000 individuals. On this side, the PGX side, we use the genetics data to predict the therapeutic dose. And on the other side of that trial, the STD or standard arm, no genetic data was used. And this, is a, this was published in 2007. It's a collaborator of ours, Brian Gage, at, the, at Washington University. 
And all we did was actually duplicate his results. Our predictions retrospectively show what he showed. And that is, for the protocols that he used, it didn't matter whether he used the genetics or not. And that's observed by the noisiness and the equal sort of distribution of in therapeutic range versus out of therapeutic range. In therapeutic range represented by yellow and out of therapeutic range represented by red. So for each individual, there's a fair amount of in therapeutic range on the left arm and the same on the right arm, and you can't visually see any difference. And statistically, you can show that your visual interpretation is correct. Now, what we could do in, in the simulation mode is we could change the protocol. And so that's what we did. We modified the genetic protocol theoretically, and we left the standard protocol the, the same. And we showed in that simulation that we could significantly change the outcome of that clinical trial. On the left side, once again, with genetics, you see a lot more in therapeutic range, represented by the red. And on the right side, you see the same amount of in and out of therapeutic range as you saw over here. And so it's just a visual representation that the prediction shows you can, if you use genetics and slightly alter the protocol, you can actually change the outcome of this clinical trial and demonstrate that the genetics have a strong impact on the outcome of the trial. And this is the sort of thing that we're focused on in the lab. Um, individual. And I told you we could do the theoretical prediction using different protocols for each individual. I showed you one example of that. Here we're actually doing four protocols on one individual. So we're running four simultaneous clinical trials with four different protocols, the same individual, an Asian female, 87 years old. And we can show that the percent in therapeutic range here for this protocol, some, some name protocol, is under 50%. For Cooper, it's about 75%. For Gedge, it's almost 80%. And for Roberts, about 75%. So here we can simulate the, the different protocols for each individual and predict the therapeutic, the TTRs, time and therapeutic range for each individual. Well, there's an obvious optimization problem that you can impose now. So you can do the simulation across the different protocols. Well, which protocol is best for this individual? It's very clear that the best protocol is GEDGE for this individual. For that individual, you're driving the time of therapeutic range up to 80%. So that's the setup of the optimization problem. So if you're interested in an optimization problem, our system produces plenty of data that allows you to optimize across individuals and protocols. And this is the basis of so-called personalized medicine where the specific evidence of each individual is used by individual by individual to optimize their treatment. Theoretically, we can do that. And so we show that across many of these protocols, and in this case, we have 100 individuals, and we simply are showing what's the optimal path across all individuals to give the best overall result. So if you're going to do this in a hospital and you have a thousand patients or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, you could actually then predict which is the optimal protocol for each of those. We actually think of them as groups of patients. And so there's a very nice optimization problem, which one of my postdocs is working on. He's written a grant for that, and uh, this is part of the preliminary data of that. So in conclusion, I just want to say a couple of things. First of all, it's not clear that genetics is going to play a dramatic role in healthcare. That's not a given, but I, I believe in certain circumstances, genetics will be valuable in healthcare in a very pragmatic way, not just in the US, but in all countries. And if we're ever going to justify the cost of genetic typing individuals, then we have to be able to show that we can optimize somehow 
between the best practice, which doesn't include genetics, and the practice that does include genetics. And that optimization has to change the cost equation because we have a little bit of an upfront cost to genotype an individual, but we want to save the money at the far end by improving healthcare, reducing risk, reducing the number of adverse events, reducing health, uh, hospital stays, and so on and so forth. So that's what my group is focused on, is to try to understand in what scenarios is genetics important and useful and pragmatically valuable in the healthcare setting versus where are those situations where it sounds good, it looks good, it's fancy and you do a lot of technology, but the bottom line is it doesn't really change anything and it costs more. And that's what we're interested in. So thank you very much for your time and attention and take any questions now or there. Thanks, Peter, for the call. Any questions? I understand that 60% uh, of the variability was due to two genes. How about the other food? Other genes or? Mostly age, um, personal health history, smoking or non-smoking status, whether you take other drugs that can interfere with the metabolism of orphan or not, sort of gross measures that are actually being used in most hospitals right now. Most physicians already understand how to adjust to these other factors already. So that 60% factor that you point out, the typical physician doesn't understand why, why is there that variability, and the genetics can give that information. Side of the question. So, uh, I thought at the beginning, uh, Dr. Islam asked about uh, could be other genes already involved? We don't know that also affects this. Uh, yeah, there's actually two other genes with four other genotypes that have been associated with warfarin variability, but the additional amount of variability is very small, it's four or five percent. And so it's sort of hard to justify doing more genotyping when you're only going to gain. Uh, probably a stochastic, you're within the stochastic range, it'd be very hard to say, oh, that's, that's very important and impactful in the clinical setting. And that's one thing, that's a big measure for my work is, we really want to look at situations where it's likely to be impactful in a pragmatic way, and not just a fancy, you know, technologically important and, use, uh, and fun, simulation, mathematical simulation, or biomedical engineer exercise in an academic sense. So, so I, I, I want to discuss one thing. So if we'd like to convoy this result to Egyptian population, what we need is aggregation of medical records to collect statistics about these parameters you showed in the slides. And then we can run the simulations and already give some conclusions about this. Well, um, there's a number of ways to answer that. I, probably, ideally, if you had all the electronic medical records, then you can more accurately understand the statistical parameterization of the Egyptian population. And that accurate accuracy translates to the accuracy of the modeling and the simulations, and, the, and therefore the predictions. But there are a number of ways to characterize the population. And so I told Mohammed uh, yesterday that we might have a surprise for him. Well, we're actually working on that project right now. And we don't have it ready for today, but we're hoping we'll be able to talk about it in the next few days. OK. Thanks, Peter, for your talk. And let us go to the next speaker.